Today we're going to make a very simple but incredibly useful project. It's a drilled charging station. I was cleaning up the shop recently and I realized there was one thing that I haven't really addressed in terms of shop organization and that was a good way of storing uh, not only my drills but also the charging packs. Uh, I've got two or three of them and you know if you guys are like me you always run into this issue where uh, the batteries are dead or you can't find the one that has the good battery. Um, so I'm, I'm going to do a few different things to address those issues but one key thing is to make sure I have a home for all of the drills and all of the charging stuff. So I built this very simple, really it's a, it's a box consisting of uh, six pieces of wood. Um, I did use really nice wood just because I had some scraps laying around, but it's really, uh, it's really not that tough to build. So let me just show it to you really quickly here. What I've got of course on the bottom is the little cubby for the drills. You could probably fit maybe five drills there if you want to. On the top is where the charging units are going to sit. Now interestingly enough what I have is an opening in the back here so that the cords can go all the way through not just all the way through here but down the bottom so I think on the underside I may have a surge protector or something to connect everything to but really really simple construction and we're going to use a special jig to do this construction I've had the dowel max in my possession for a little while now and I just haven't had a chance to use it so I figured a very basic, simple project like this is a good place to try something that's new because you don't want to really do it on something that's really super critical or you know, something that's a little bit more complex than you're ready for. Uh, this project was perfect for testing this jig out and just seeing how it works. So um, I'll cut the parts all to size and let's just jump right into it. For this project, I'm using two pieces of figured maple for the shelves, 16 inches long, five and a quarter inches wide, and 5 eighths of an inch thick. Two pieces of babinga for the sides, 13 inches long, 8 inches wide, and 3 quarters of an inch thick. And two pieces of babinga for the back supports, 16 inches long, 3 and 3 quarters inches wide, and 3 quarters of an inch thick. So let's get started by attaching the bottom shelf to the side piece. So our bottom shelf is going to go roughly in this location. It's going to be set up from the bottom and it's going to be about, I would say about a quarter inch in from the edge just to give a nice reveal. So the first thing I want to do is mark that line about a quarter inch in. And this is for reference later. And the distance that this shelf is up from the bottom, we'll adjust that later with the jig itself. It's actually very easy to do. But the first thing I want to do is put these pieces together roughly in the orientation that they're going to be. And the idea here is to make a few check marks that are going to be good reference points for us. So the adjoining faces here each get a check mark. And I call this a face even though right here we're working with end grain. But that's okay because we're going, you know, it's, it's just the type of joint that we're doing. It's still a reference face that will help us line up our jig. So basically check mark, check mark, check mark, check mark. And the only other thing I like to do, this is also something they recommend, is put an X on the faces that are going to receive your joinery. And this way, when the pieces are in the clamps and we don't have them together in this orientation to tell us where the holes go, uh, these reference lines will help us align our jig and we won't make many mistakes. Now this jig is right up my alley and I'll tell you why because it doesn't let me screw up, no matter what I do. <laughs> it seems to have built-in anti-mark screw-up features. Um, we marked our check marks on, on the face and the side here, and if you look at the jig, there's a check mark on the side, and there's a check mark on the inside face, right there. So what that tells me is all I need to do is line up the two check marks I put on my workpiece with the two check marks on the jig itself. Okay, so these faces line up and these check marks touch. That lets me know I'm in the right spot. All I need to do is flush it up with my finger here, tighten the little clamps, and now I can drill. Now the drill bit has a stop collar on it that's going to make sure that we go the right depth so we don't even have to think when it comes to doing that. Uh, you also have the option of placement of these holes. Now I'm going to go all the way across and I'm probably going to wind up with four dowel holes across the, uh, the end grain here on this board. 
So just to stop myself from, you know, accidentally drilling in the wrong place, I've removed uh, the little, I don't even know what you call this thing, the little collar, I guess. I removed it from the two middle positions because I'm going to skip those. I only want to drill in these three positions. You could leave them in there as long as you know not to, to use them, but they're there if you need them. So let's go ahead and drill. Now you'll notice we still have about two inches of board left and I want to get another dowel in there. So this is one of the coolest things about this guy. I've got a little indexing pin. So now all I need to do, see I've got my three holes here. All I need to do is line up the jig, take the indexing pin and drop it into the next hole. It's a very tight fit. That's not going anywhere. In fact, you really don't even need the clamps at this point, but I'm going to use them anyway. And this will have moved me over one position, meaning that this final hole here on the end is freed up and I could add one more dowel hole. Now our top and bottom shelves are essentially going to have that same exact joinery on each one of them. So while the jig is, is set up for that position, it's not a bad idea to do them all at once, all four uh, edges of the work pieces. Now, if you decide to do that, just make sure that you do the setup once again and put those check marks in the right place and that'll ensure that you don't make any mistakes. So now we can move on to the side pieces. Now this is where things get interesting with the jig. If we look at the way this piece is going to sit in here, we need our dowel holes to be in the face of this board. We also need it to be set back a quarter inch from the position that these, uh, these holes were and we need it to be set down. I think it's about three quarters of an inch. So what are we going to do with the jig? Well, the jig in its existing setup right now is not really going to work because it's at the point that it's at now, it's meant to secure the workpiece like so. This puts the holes into the end grain. That is not what we want here. We need the holes in the face. So that's not going to work, right? Fortunately, they obviously thought of that and we have some attachments that we can put on here to change it over. So instead of this whole unit that we have here, what we're going to do is replace it with this very simple right angle. And what that's going to allow us to do is turn the jig this way on the workpiece and we'll be able to reference from this top edge and secure it in place and get our holes on the face. So let's disassemble it and add the, uh, the new fence. Nothing really tricky here. We're just going to loosen these guys. And you see a long thread here. The good thing is the threads are sufficiently loose that you can just zip these things right off of there. So they travel a, a pretty good length in a short amount of time. So this whole uh, contraption here, the clamping unit comes off. And what we can now do is add that guy back on. And just tighten it up. Okay, and now we can go back to the workpiece. So now let's see what we have. Check mark here, check mark here. So instead of going like this, we are now in this orientation and we're able to satisfy the need to line up the check marks. So we've got a check mark on the edge of the jig, the check mark on the edge of the workpiece, and here's our other check mark there that's meeting the little check mark on the inside. Okay, so by going right here like this, we are satisfying the requirements of, of those check marks. And I would just put a clamp down at the bottom to hold it in position. But what's the one problem here? If we drill right here, our holes are gonna be right up near the top. What that's gonna do is bring our shelf piece in flush with the bottom. And that's not what we want. We want it offset a little bit. Well, fortunately, the jig comes with little spacers. And this is where, you know, we had to measure at the front here to set this back. Well, we don't have to worry about that for the uh, offset coming up from the bottom. We're gonna use this little guy and he's gonna offset us about three quarters of an inch. So to add this to the jig, it's very simple. That's what these knobs are here for. So just loosen those up. Pull that back. Drop the little spacer in, tighten it up again. 
And now finally, we have the setup that we need to line up perfectly. Now, again, if I go flush here, what we're gonna do is put the holes too far out because we want that offset. So that's why I drew that line. That line gives me a nice reference point. So I'm lining up my check mark with that line instead of lining it up flush to the outside. Just a quick reminder, if I went right to the outside, I would be up front like this, but I want a little reveal. I want this spaced back. So that pencil line just gives me a nice simple reference. Okay, let's uh, clamp it up and start drilling. But bingo, is hard stuff. Okay, so much like before, we can now use the index pin to give us that one last hole. And I found that this is pretty secure. I don't feel the need to even clamp that to get the last hole in. Very nice. So you can see how once you get this thing set up for one of the operations, you kind of want to go through and do them all at once. And this way you're not changing things back and forth all the time. Now the top shelf is pretty much the same as the bottom shelf. It's not all that different. It's also going to be set back a quarter inch. The only difference is the set setback from the top is a little bit less than we had from the bottom. So this big spacer that we used here is going to be a little bit too much. Now, fortunately, they have multiple spacers that you can use. This is a much smaller spacer at about a quarter inch. Pop that guy in there, and now I can do those top joints. And as long as I have my check marks in all the right places, which I could do as the very first step on all of my work pieces, I can go back through and get them all done and cut them all or drill them all at the same time. So there's no real need for you to see me do you know, uh, 20 or 30 holes. Uh, we'll just jump right up to the assembly. And actually one last step before assembly, I may as well sand all the pieces to 180 grit and I'm going to ease all of the edges here with a little tiny round over bit just to smooth them so there's nothing to catch your fingers on or anything like that. This babinga is hard stuff and if you don't ease those edges, it can and will cut you. So um, use the router table for that. So the glue up on this shouldn't be too difficult. I'm just gonna basically add some glue to each hole. And I'll start with one of the side pieces. I've got a little acid brush here. Just push it in and then kind of twist it up and down a little bit. Make sure it spreads. And now I can grab some dowels, drop them in there. It's not a bad idea if you have enough time to, to get some glue on the dowels themselves. But if you're in a rush, just make sure you get a, a good amount of uh, glue into the hole and you should have enough glue sort of going into all these little fine uh, lines that are on the dowels. The glue can kind of travel up through those. And don't worry too much about the glue squeeze out because that's just going to spread and give us a little bit more uh, of a grip. Even though it's end grain, we still want a little bit of glue there if we can get it. Okay, and now I'll move on to the other side piece. Time is of the essence here, that's for sure. Now the good thing about using a system like this, well, there's a couple good things in addition to it being a, a very simple way to assemble a project, is with so many points of contact, there's really no room 
for error there. So these pieces can't shift forward and back at all. There's no wiggle room. Um, another thing is if your pieces are all cut nice and square on their edges, when you clamp them home, this thing should somewhat, especially with these back pieces in place, it should almost self-square. You shouldn't have to do much to adjust it for square. And in fact, it's dead on. Both sides are rock solid. So you can't ask for much more than that. It makes it nice and simple. So I'll give this a little bit of time to dry. I'll let my squeeze out set up a little bit before I scrape that away. Um, but this is pretty much done. Very simple project. So here we are at the end of day one, and believe it or not, I've got a completed project. Um, everything is done. It's sanded, finished. Um, quickly, just to let you know what I did with the finish, I wanted something that would dry fast. Ultimately, this is just shop furniture, and I need this thing on the wall so I can move on to other stuff. Uh, what I wound up doing with it is applying a quick coat of amber shellac, uh, roughly about a two pound cut. The idea was to seal it. It's also something that dries very quickly, and the amber shellac tends to bring a little bit of uh, color to the maple, which is something that I wanted since it is a figured maple. And what I did for a top coat is some of this new stuff by General Finishes. It's their Endurovar gloss. I'm not sure if this is out yet. I think it comes out sometime in March. I'll keep you guys posted on that. But this was sprayed uh, via HVLP, and it sprayed great. I, I really, um, the stuff looks pretty good. Now it's still curing, so some of the, uh, there's just a little bit of an orange peely texture to it, but this was just sprayed today. It's dry to the touch, but you gotta give it some time to fully cure. So that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, but I do need to hang this thing on the wall. It's gonna go right over there by the electrical outlet. And I, I mentioned in the beginning having the problems with the uh, batteries not being charged and, and not leaving these things plugged in all the time. So very simple solution for that. What I'm gonna do to address it is use a timer. So everything will be connected to this surge protector. Okay, the surge protector will likely live on the underside here toward the back. Everything's gonna, the cords are all gonna drop down through the holes back here, plug into the surge protector, and the surge protector is gonna be plugged into this timer. This timer is set to run for one hour a day. So basically it just kind of charges it, makes sure it's topped off, and then cuts the power. And I'm hoping that alleviates any of those concerns about keeping these uh, battery packs charging um, all the time, which is supposed to be a little bit dangerous. So I think I have licked that problem. Now, the interior dimension here is 16 inches, and you may wanna widen that out a little bit because if you have 16 inch on center studs, you may have to angle your screws in a little bit at a, uh, well, not the best angle if you're gonna go directly into the wall. Where mine is going, my screws are actually, uh, I've only got one stud to work with, so the good thing is I do have screw surface on the top and the bottom, so I'm just gonna drive a screw in the top, one in the bottom, and that should be enough to hold it. Uh, it's not gonna be too heavy, so that's where we're at. But a uh, very simple one-day project, and um, obviously you could take this in a lot of different directions, but as simple as it is, using some you know, pretty decent wood that's got some visual interest to it and a nice finish, all of a sudden something simple looks uh, pretty elegant. So just a few comments about the Dallamax. I don't really want to turn this into a commercial for a product, but part of this project was taking the opportunity to try this thing out for myself and see what I thought of it and use it on a relatively simple project so I can you know, not push the limits too much on something I'm not that familiar with. But what you need to know is that this thing is capable of so much more. I mean, what we did here just really scratches the surface of what this system can do. And that's really the key is to, to not look at this as a dowling jig uh, so much as a joinery system. And as a system, it can do a lot of stuff. I mean, frankly, if you wanted to use this as your primary joinery for every project, you certainly could. Um, you know, people have different opinions on what, how they feel about dowels. That's, that's your personal uh, decision there. I'm not gonna try to influence anybody one way or the other, but if you do like dowel joinery, uh, this is a fantastic way to make them with really, really tight tolerances. Um, Strength-wise, you know, I've seen conflicting information when it comes to numbers on how strong uh, dowels are. Uh, Dow Max's numbers look really, really strong and certainly um, competitive with the mortise and tenon and more than enough than, than you would really need for normal furniture applications, which is kind of cool. Um, another thing that some people may not know is there are some craftsmen, very well-known craftsmen, who uh, pretty much used, uh, used dowels exclusively for their case joinery, specifically James Krenoff. Nearly uh, every one of his pieces that I've seen, at least in books and things, was made using dowel joints. He favored them for whatever his reasons were, and 
um, you know, we trust his opinion on a lot of things and, uh, and take our cues from him in a lot of things. So it's certainly something to consider. So check it out if you have a chance. The Dalmex is, is pretty darn cool. Um, so we'll, we'll basically, this is gonna be in the shop and I'll be able to watch this puppy and see how it holds up. But honestly, uh, we've got some pretty thick dowels, you know, four per joint. And um, I don't think this thing is going anywhere. So pretty happy with the results and check out the jig. Hopefully, hopefully you'll be able to make one of these yourself. And, you know, frankly, I hope you build upon this because this is really basic. Uh, think about a nice set of drawers at the bottom or something like that, uh, where you could put drill bits and things. There's a lot that you could do with it. But I was in a rush and bada bing, bada boom, this is what we've got. So thanks for watching.